Welcome to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast with your host, Emmett Muckles. Please visit iTunes, Stitcher, or EmmettMuckles.com to listen to all the episodes for free. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast. This is your host, Emmett Muckles. This is the day the Lord has made. I woke up, I was glad because I made it another day. Remember, we are all billionaires. Stop thinking about that money thing. You came into this life, you're at the top of the food chain. If you look just at your hand, it is covered in a myriad of cells. There are at least 5 billion, 10 billion, 20 billion cells there. You came into this life a billionaire. 30 days after inception, 2 to the power of 30 equals 1,734,800,000, something like that. So you're a billionaire. So now it's time to live your life and find your path. Heather Hawkins found her path, and this is my guest today. If you want to know about PR, you know, the world has changed. It used to be, you used to have to get a company, and you have to, you know, pay like five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 just to get your name out there. You know, social media has changed some of that, but you still need a pro. You need somebody who knows what they're doing, and Heather Hawkins is that person. Hey, Heather. Hi, uh. How are you doing? I'm good. Now, you were in the thick of things. You were in the L.A. base. Were you in L.A. or were you in San Francisco? Oh, I was born in Los Angeles, spent most of my life in San Francisco, and spent one regrettable year living in New York City. And uh, Yeah, not just kind of New York City. I lived like in the heart of Hell's Kitchen. But that's, you know, that's a major difference when you come from the West Coast. I mean, whether if you're on one coast and you get transplanted to the other, it's a major culture shock. Yeah. Yeah. Well, interestingly, I, I moved to New York City on the first flight out of SFO after 9-11. So I, I left San Francisco, you know, it must have been like the 17th of September of that year. First literal first direct flight from San Francisco to New York City. And so I feel like I got a really interesting slice of New York City. People right. were telling me They're the in- city was more... Los Angeles and San Francisco than it ever had been because everybody was like loving each other and like right. helping each other out and all this kind of stuff. Um, so I got an interesting view of New York City, but even with that, you know, quite cataclysmic impact on people's personalities, I still found it a little off putting for me. <laughs> so let's let's journey back. You were in the world of PR and mm-hmm. you know, and the West Coast, if it's not Chicago, New York, or LA. Those are the spots for PR, the main hubs historically. Well, except for the fact that I came into PR in 1997 in San Francisco and I went into video game and technology PR. And so it was a time. Yeah. Um, So I spent the first, you know, five, six years of my career in video game PR. I worked for IDOS Interactive. I did the launch of Sega Dreamcast for them. Oh, Um, Yeah. Laura Croft. (laughs) Laura Croft. Yeah. I, I got some stories. I had the very, I had it on computer disc in 95. Yeah. (laughs) I loved it. Yeah. Anyway, do your thing. You just got me all geeked up. Oh yeah, totally. Um, so for, for me and for technology and for coming into PR, you know, that was exactly where you had to be, you know, San Francisco. Was that your intention? No. So, I majored in radio. I got my degree in radio broadcasting and I was working at a radio station in Santa Rosa, which is just north of San Francisco. And my mentor, very nice man, pulled me aside and said, there is no money in radio (laughs) unless you stick with it for like five years. Um, and at the time I was doing stand up comedy as well. And he said, there's also no creativity and I don't want you going off script again, girl. I, I'm going to ring that hotline. I'm going to ring that hotline next time I hear you go off script. Um, and so I was finishing up my last semester of college. There was an ad in the college radio station that said some company wants somebody who knows, um, radio 
to come work at this company. And I was like, okay. And it said it paid $1,500 a month. It was an internship paid $1,500 a month. So I was like, oh my gosh, that's like retirement money. Wait a minute. This, wait, wait, wait a minute. This was in 98? 97. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't this, it wasn't the Bay Area we know now. No, it was not the Bay Area we know now. Um, so I wandered into this company for this $1,500 a month internship into a sea of like bleach blonde hair and Kate Spade bags and Steve Madden pumps. And I had blue hair and a nose ring. <laughs> I wandered into this company like downtown San Francisco. I was like, you want somebody who knows radio? Like <laughs> that's me. And it was funny because we ended up getting on like gangbusters and it really kind of gave me, it's where I got the tagline for my business was what, which was that entrepreneurs have radical authenticity, which is the one thing that media wants more than anything. They want you to be who you are. And it doesn't mean that you have to be blue hair and a nose ring. It just means that whatever you are is what brings you value and is what media wants from you. They don't want you to be buffed and polished and spit shined and like, message to the nines. They want your authentic point of view. So anyhow, that's kind of how I accidentally stumbled into doing PR. And I did video game PR for a while, moved to New York. I did music marketing. I worked on Maroon 5's first album. Oh, that was a bomb I, I album came... too. That, bomb, yeah. <laughs> that album was like my stuff. I was DJing at the time. Oh, nice. Nice. Oh, I couldn't. Anyway, you're just, you're just taking me back. Stop it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been a bit of a dabbler, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> and then I came back to San Francisco after the New York city thing and um, spent some more time in technology and ultimately, um, found a niche for the past decade in the human performance space. So oh. nutrition, gear, biometrics, biohacking. That's the um, thing that is hot. Yeah. I'm, I'm also like kind of a medical science nerd too. So I got to do the PR thing and the medical science thing at the same time. So, so you like your person, it seems like your mind is always moving. Like a person, I call it my type, which is something shiny. Like we find our own shiny things and we gravitate toward them like moths to a flame. And it's like, everyone else is like, why are you doing that? And it's like, that's my shiny thing. You don't yeah. understand. <laughs> so how did that lead to like, um, your experience what i mean what did you get out of that point because you're, you're working in radio and you're working in basically promotion was it a lot of promotion that you were doing and well i was an on-air personality so i was driving to santa rosa to record a show and then in between the breaks i was recording a sunday show so i was ending up getting paid like less than half of minimum wage to do this radio show. And yeah, I mean, it was a lot of promotion. It was a lot of like, read this script and go host the Eddie money show and go, <laughs> you know, to the Mardi Gras festival and like the hypnotist show and like whatever was going on in Santa Rosa at the time. Um, you know, it gave me a pretty good background when I got into PR because I understood it. Um, but, you know, for me with PR, the thing was I wanted to be famous. When I graduated from college, that was the one thing that I wanted to be. And I had absolutely no talents that might portend fame. I couldn't sing. I couldn't dance. Um, I, I had some fun doing stand-up comedy for a while. But I, through PR, I got to be both smart and famous at the same time. I mean, I was on MTV and CNN and ESPN and the local news and NPR, like my mom called me up and was like, I heard you on NPR <laughs> the morning of the launch of Sega Dreamcast. So it's like, I got to scratch that itch. And I think a lot of times for entrepreneurs, um, you know, spoiler alert, I have actually transitioned my business now to where what I do is I coach executives and entrepreneurs on how to build those two-way media relationships so that they can build that wildly visible personal brand. Um, and, you know, the cool thing for me was that I got to do the smart piece of it. And I also got to scratch that wanting to be seen and wanting to be heard and wanting to be a thought leader in an industry kind of a, you know, need. So, you know, it's, it's a funny thing because everybody wants to go viral, but one of the quickest ways to go viral is to be in the media. Yes. You know, yeah. it, it, I mean, you, you cannot. So here's the thing. Um, you know, as now that 
now that I've transitioned more, so two years ago, I stepped out of my own, started an agency and I was doing done for you PR services for people. And then I realized for the, the real upstart people I wanted to work with, the people with the passionate point of view and the people that made the thing and work on the thing, for a lot of those people, an agency just is never going to make sense. So that's how I transitioned to coaching those people, right? And so I myself am learning how to market an online business, which is totally different from building a brand for a Cliff Bar or a Camelback or you know <laughs> any of the other companies that I've worked with, right? It's a totally different deal. Um, and I'm trying to remember where I was going with this thought. Um, <laughs> now, um, it's the fact that you know they're they're media can drive viral mark viral and viral yes. can draw can drive media but mm -hmm. i think it's balanced heavily like if i was to get on fox 2 news today yeah and, and i just and i said what my name is emmett muckles first of all that's a very brandable name you're going to remember mm -hmm. like there's some funny brown guy Funny looking brown guy with a name that I can't I picture the old white guy having. And you're going to start Googling me right away. Yep. And they're going to say, this is Emmett Muckles and he is your expert in X, Y, Z. And the fact that someone else has said it makes it true to the people that view it. I mean, I'm not going down a wormhole about whether or not we should be believing the media, but there is a... I call it a halo of endorsement that happens yeah. when channel two news has you on and says that you are Emmett Muckles X, Y, Z. Um, because we believe that you wouldn't be there if you weren't worth your salt. You know, you're not going to be in Forbes fast company. You're not going to be quoted in that article. And I remember where I was headed before, which is people are saying, you know, all the coaches, all the build your own business coaches are saying, create content every single day, have a podcast, put out one episode a day, be on Facebook lives every afternoon for two hours, create mountains and mountains of articles and hope that somebody picks this up, hope that somebody clicks on it. Right. And it's like, no, media is in the job, in the business of making content. And they need people to be in that content because they cannot write those articles without Emmett Muckles, the expert in XYZ to be the expert source in those articles. So for me, not only is the reputation building and the personal brand building just exponential when you're getting the word out through media, it's easier because you don't have to sit down and think about how am I going to come up with another two-hour podcast? How am I going to come up with another five <laughs> Facebook Live topics this week? You just need to say, hey, let me observe the media um, and let me see what they're talking about and yeah. see if there's a place for me to insert myself. And once you learn the process, it becomes supernatural. Um, and then also those media relationships, media are some of the most passionate pundits in any industry. So having the ear of media to say, Hey, you know, I'm just thinking about this idea. Do you think that this is an idea that would fly? They will tell you because they care deeply usually about the topics that they're covering. Right. So how did you move from working for someone to working for yourself. What was that transition like? Did you know anything about business? Did you know about like LLCs and corporations and accountants and I might need a lawyer and I might need this EIN number? How did all that come about in your yeah. universe? <laughs> so God bless um, the woman who has been my mentor. Her name is Lee. She's been my mentor since she was actually my very first um, client when I was at that PR agency, when I was the blue haired intern. Um, she was marketing. She was a VP or director of marketing or something for Sega. She continued to be my mentor. And in fact, she was my boss in San Francisco at my last job in San Francisco. I was a vice president at her agency. Um, and I had just come back from having my second child. Um, and, you know, we had had some clients leave and I really wanted to work with these smaller clients. And she was explaining to me the realities of business yeah. and the realities of business development and having to keep on bringing that business in. And I was like, well, why can't we just bring in some of these smaller clients? And what if we put like five clients into one bucket and then they all add it up to like one client? Can't we, <laughs> can't we still, you know, and I'm doing all sorts of wickety whack math, like trying to make the whole thing work out and all this stuff. And she's like, Heather, you know, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work that way. Um, and so when I left, um, 
I, you know, that job and I, we mutually kind of parted ways. And I realized within one week that staying in San Francisco didn't make any sense at all. I had two young kids. Um, the lifestyle in San Francisco had just, for me, deteriorated. Uh, the culture had changed so much. Yeah. And so we packed up and moved to the mountains. So now I live at about 7,000 foot elevation in a small town that has about fewer than 10,000 full-time residents in it um, called Truckee, which it, is near Northern Lake Tahoe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so when I moved up here and started Elevation Strategy, which is my agency, I said, I'm going to work with these smaller guys. I'm going to find a way to make the math work for these upstarts and the people in the human performance space and the biohacking space that I really want to work with. <laughs> and surprise, surprise, much to no one's surprise, um, I ended up having an epiphany about a year later, which was, look, you know, I am trying to do PR right for these people. These people are always, because they're at this certain size, they're always still saying, my God, this is a chunk of change that I'm paying for, <laughs> for these services. And like, you know, what do you mean I don't get to own these media relationships if we stop working together? You know, what do you mean you don't just hand over your private list to me? And, I, and it's like, how about if I train, like, I, I would love to just train you so that you can own these relationships. And it makes so much more sense at a certain point um, you know, when you're an entrepreneur and then when you get big enough to have an agency, you are going to get so much value out of that agency. If you have spent some time nurturing those relationships yourself and understanding what it looks like. Um, but as for like all the business stuff of figuring out how to run my business, I, I definitely got the universal backhand when I <laughs> thought that I was coming here, um, you know, to form this different kind of of agency, but I'm glad that I did because it's what gave me this epiphany that I should be empowering people. So for the past 23 years, I've been part of the PR industrial complex, as I've come to call it, which means that agencies and PR people are trying to, to share myths that you can't just get in touch with media or that there's secret handshakes or secret codes or like expensive systems or that you have to have like decades old media relationships. And, and it's just not true. The world is flat. Anyone can contact anyone. The media wants to hear from you. So I feel like mine really is a message of empowerment. Um, and I feel like I'm so passionate about it because I realized for the past 20 years, I've been kind of spreading untruth a little bit. <laughs> so when you're working with a client, what's your timetable? Is it like a finite, like, okay, I can get you up to speed once you know where their PR intelligence lie. Yeah. You're like, so I need to I work with you for a month or is a six month contract or a year, or this is ongoing because you are a hot mess. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a, I have a six week curriculum that I teach over the course of it's a one hour coaching call every week and one hour of MP3 audio. So people can learn on the go and then worksheets. And over the course of six weeks, we can cover how to build a brand that you love, how to lock it in, how to set it and forget it. And then we talk about how to know what your customer wants to hear from you and where they're going to go looking for that information. And then we get into the nuts and bolts of like, here's how you follow media. Here's how you find media. When it's time to reach out, here's what they want from you. That's after the yeah. six weeks. Uh, that's within the six weeks. Oh, oh okay. Within yeah. the six weeks. That is pretty awesome. Do you ever go out and travel and like talk to people to bring them into the fold or to educate people to let them know this is how this system works. It's yeah. not what you think. So the other day I drove all the way down to Reno, which is like 20 minutes away to spread the good news, <laughs> to spread the gospel of my, of, um, Elevation Visibility Academy. Um, so I, I actually, it's funny cause I was just talking smart about Facebook lives and stuff like that. I do lots of stuff on Facebook live. Um, and then I have relationships in Reno and in San Francisco where I have like a two hour seminar that I can teach that goes through most of the stuff that we go over in the six week program. But here's the thing, you know, without the hand holding, I feel like it's half and half expert input. So me looking at your brand statement, my God, I've seen some doozies and saying like, 
that me, nobody's going to know what that means. <laughs> like, I realize you're in love with your brand statement, but like, let's get it to where somebody's going to actually understand what it means. Like the billionaire um, lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I like that though. It's catchy. You, you, it's approachable. Right. Um, so I feel like it's half and half of expert input and, and helping you really see it as other people are going to see it. And then the other half of it is really mindset and helping you understand that you deserve a seat at any table and media wants to talk to you and that you bring great value. And that when you're making out to outreach to media the right way, it's not salesy because it's always going to be like a value-based exchange. So I feel like the six weeks is enough time to teach the hard stuff, you know, the hard skills you might call them that you need to know. And then also to ingrain the soft skills. So me being there the first time a reporter writes back and says, I have no idea why you would contact me about this because they do that kind of thing sometimes. Um, but then also me being there to celebrate with you the first time that media writes back and says, oh my gosh, I've been looking for somebody like you wow. forever. And that first time you get your name in ink and the first time your mom calls and says, hey, I heard you on NPR. Like that's a it's an awesome, awesome moment just to feel that validation, especially for we entrepreneurs and solo business people who spend a lot of time by ourselves and who kind of our friends and family and social circles sometimes are saying, what are you doing? <laughs> like, I don't understand what you do. Right. Well, to be able to give them an article from Forbes and say, this is what I do has an awful lot of impact. So we're going up in an elevator. So we're, we're going to a, to a building. You, we're both coming in out from out in the rain and we're rushing through the door and I hold the door for this beautiful woman and we both head to the elevator and you know uncomfortably we're the only two on the elevator so to break the ice we have about seven floors to go up and I go what do you do what's your elevator speech my elevator speech is that I help entrepreneurs and executives build wildly visible personal brands by nurturing media relationships. Wow, that was like on point. It was like click. <laughs> a lot Can of you tell this is kind of what I do for a living. Um, <laughs> no, but I have to say, even even with myself, I go back and forth because I started out saying I help entrepreneurs and executives build visible brands by doing their own PR. And you know what that sounds like to most people? sounds like a big old honking job yeah. that I am plonking down on their desk and saying, here, have another job when it's not that because nurturing media relationships is something that's going to pay dividends in multiple ways, you know, ink yeah. and feedback and reputation and all that kind of stuff. So even with myself, it's a constant process of testing out, but making sure that brand DNA remains the same. All right. I have to ask you about, there are some myths most people don't realize that they're myths, but they're myths. What are the myths about PR and being your own publicist? Yes. Um, so there is a myth that you have to have decades old media relationships. Um, I downloaded a Udemy course the other day for, that was supposed to be how to do your own PR or how to do PR. And the entire course was like, hire an agency, find an expert. And the guy actually said in this course that media will not open an email unless it comes from either an agency or someone that they already know. That is absolutely not true at all. I use the example that when I was blue hair nose ring girl who started at the PR agency, I didn't have media relationships and I was pitching Walt Mossberg and placing stories with him at the Wall Street Journal within like two months of being there. Wow. So you don't have to have them. Yes, you're going to build them. And that's going to be, you know, I can teach you how to do that. And it's going to be easy. It's going to be awesome. And it's going to pay dividends, but you don't have to have decades old media relationships. That's myth number um, one. Yeah. Uh, the next myth is that you have to have insanely expensive um, tools and subscription services and databases and like tracking stuff. I will tell you, Google alerts has blown my freaking mind <laughs> so many times. You know, I'm sitting here waiting for this $5,000 a month media monitoring thing to tell me when my client's article is going to hit. And Google alerts is like, ping, here it is. Like, yeah. and oh, click here and you can see all the other places it ran to. Um, email addresses. Anybody can find anybody's email address. It's not that difficult. Media is more accessible than ever thanks to social media. So sorry, all these companies that have built their businesses around 
super expensive media databases um, don't need them. And also the information that comes out of them is really generic. And it's far better for you to look at a reporter's Twitter feed and pull out those things that connect with you and your customer than it is to say something that some database told you. Right. So that's two. Now, yeah. And I know there's more, but we'll let them contact you to find out more. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Now, the one thing that you did say, like in our earlier conversations, was um, what Maroon 5 can teach us literally about being radically authentic. What, what does that yeah. mean? Yeah. Um, so when Maroon 5 came to us um, at the agency I was at in New York, they first showed up as a headshot and a CD because uh, CDs were a thing at the time. And this headshot, you could just see how uncomfortable they were. Like, I think one of them <laughs> was literally wearing a Jerry Seinfeld pirate shirt. <laughs> like it was absolutely ridiculous. Um, and we kind of looked at it. It was 2001. It was like, you know, the Backstreet Boys, I think it broken up and sync was on their last tour. Brittany was like a couple months away from taking an umbrella to some paparazzi's car. It was not the time to be a boy band. And we, we were kind of like, we don't know what we're going to do with these guys. I took the CD home. I listened to the CD. I was you know, doing other stuff. And all of a sudden it caught my ear. And I was like, these guys are really, really freaking good though. Yeah. Like they are actually extremely good. And when we saw them live, we were completely blown away. And we said, here's the deal. Like, we don't know who dressed you up like this for this, for this headshot. You know, we don't know. Anything except for the fact that if you even have an iota boy band about you, which you don't, but if you even go down that path a little bit, you're going to have like a six month shelf life and then it's all going to be over. This is not right. the time to be going down that path. So we actually spent a year with Maroon 5 turning down opportunities to be on the cover of like Young Miss Magazine, which was a huge magazine at the time. Um, on the cover of all of those like teeny bopper magazines, we were sending them out to like dirt patch, Iowa to be at the Jeep, you know, we <laughs> were all the Jeep people. We were basically saying, we're only going to send you places where we lead with music and it's going to be painful. You know, there are going to be times when we're like, wait a minute, but we're turning down a cover. And it's like, yeah, we're turning down a cover to be authentically you so that you can have that longevity and, and all, all coverage is not good coverage, right? That's yeah. another myth. It's got to be the right coverage. And by owning kind of who they were, I believe that that's what gave them the longevity versus saying, oh, we can hop on the tail end of this bandwagon and get some like quick term returns. Yeah. Cause they're still pumping out things and it's going on 20 years. Oh yeah. Hey, thanks for reminding me. <laughs> Yeah, I've been in this industry for a long old time. I was actually cool. about to say a quarter century. I was I was rewriting my bio the other day and I almost dropped a quarter century and I was like, I'm not going to go there. Don't but yeah, I mean, they've been, they've been around for a long old time and they wouldn't have been if they'd have gotten labeled as a boy band. And yeah. sometimes it just means sticking to your guns and saying no to some stuff. Yeah, it's really bizarre because, I, you know, I, I'm from the Midwest. I'm in Indiana, not far from Chicago. And I'm from Detroit originally. But you would always see movies and you'd see movie stars and you'd be like, that's their publicist. That's their PR person. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what, what does that mean? And then I wrote a book like in 2008 and somebody says, you need a PR person. <laughs> I literally called a local agency. They're like, uh, it's $5,000 a month. Give us all your material. Tell us everything about you and we'll craft it and get it out. I was like, I just self-published a book that cost me two grand. Yeah. What? Five grand. <laughs> I was like, if, yep. if I'm going to pay you $5,000 a month, there's going to be a lot of crimes committed in the local area. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like strange. This book's hitting the top 10 in unrelated news. There's yeah. also been a crime spree. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean that that's kind of the litmus that I tell people is that when you get to the point where you can spend about four or five thousand dollars a month, an agency can start to do some great stuff for you and can take some stuff off your plate. But below that, 
Um, I feel like a relationship game. I feel like it shouldn't, it shouldn't have to take you that long. Um, and those are some of the other myths, you know, people want you to think it's a numbers game or that you have to spam your announcement out to like thousands of people. I would way rather see an entrepreneur, an author, a speaker, a thought leader say, these are the five people that I really care about. I'm going to start watching these guys and girls, ladies, women, whatever the right thing to say is. Um, and I'm going to start forging relationship. I'm going to start to understand what matters to the, to these media that can help me. I'm going to see where I can help them and I'm going to keep it really approachable. So far too often people want to just blast that stuff. I call it, um, throwing spaghetti. You know, people just hope that if they throw enough spaghetti, something's going to stick, yeah. but that stuff that sticks, it's not even the stuff that really moves the needle for you. Yeah. You know, and I was looking at media I've actually, I used to be a media freak. I used to love, I love electronics and I love media. I can't stomach it now, you know, in this day and age because everything to me seems cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. Everything is a reboot. I don't, you know, all the authentic things you literally have to go look for. You have to find the things that are tuned with yourself. Thank God for Spotify and some of these services now because the record stores are gone away. Mm -hmm. But it is about authenticity because, you know, for most people, if they have 500 to 1,000 true fans, they have sustainability. Yeah. And most yeah. people don't realize. They think, oh, I, I got to get everybody to notice me. No, you. some of you only need like 250 people. If you can get 250 loyal fans, you're going to have a nice little trip there. Yeah. And, yeah. and people don't understand that. Yeah. And two things, two things on that topic. I love that you brought it up. Um, number one is it's people like you and me and the people that I work with my clients being in contact with media and talking to media about what's really going on within their niche and their authentic, radically authentic points of view on their niche. That's going to keep that media from being so cookie cutter. So it's the, it's the influence of the people that have the luxury of being opinionated and radically authentic. Um, that's going to keep that from being quite so homogenous. And then the other thing is you don't have to go to Forbes and New York times and wall street journal and all this kind of stuff, because there are so many niche niche publications where, um, I've heard the example of podcasts used a lot and I've seen it to be true in my business where I can be on a podcast that has like you know, a hundred thousand listeners and get like maybe one person getting in touch or I can be on a podcast that has 500 listeners and I can get 25 people getting yeah. in touch because you're able to get so niche with understanding who you want to talk to and going out and talking to the spot on right person. And yeah, it feels nice to say you're in the New York times or your mom loves it when you're on NPR or get a story in Forbes. But as far as real needle moving media, there's so much you know, it's basically a step above consumer generated. It's a step above you know, fan media, really. Um, but that's what really moves the needle is having authentic conversations within those media a lot of times. How can people find you? Yeah. So the best way for people to reach me is probably through elevationmastermind.live. There's a little three buttons you can click which button interests you the most <laughs> and you can get your email address over to me. And that's a great way for us to start having a conversation. Um, and then elevation hyphen strategy.com is kind of, you know, that website that has my bio and all the clients I've worked with and all that kind of mumbo jumbo. If anybody wants to read about that. <laughs> um, otherwise I have a Facebook profile, which is Heather Hawkins biz. And I'm on there pretty much every day doing all the things that I talked bad about doing. Do you do much on, this how about LinkedIn? Are you, are you? Yeah. I'm also on LinkedIn, Heather Hawkins. Um, and I'm trying to think, cause I know that there are a couple of us. I think that I am H Hawkins as the yeah, shortened do... version of it. But if you look for Heather Hawkins and the one that's a visibility coach, that's me. What do you have in your mindset in the next 18 months? What does that vision board in your head say? This is what it's going to be for Heather Hawkins in 18 months. What's new? 
this is what it's going to be for Heather Hawkins in 18 months. Um, within 18 months, I would like to have helped 200 entrepreneurs and executives form those kinds of really media relationships where they have, you know, the top five media in their space on speed dial, where they can have those two way conversations um, that both result in coverage and basically give them a great year to bend within their media um, or within their industry. And then also, since I'm new to this entrepreneurial thing, I hope that in 18 months, I'll just have it systematized. Like I never want to stop learning because I love the learning of the entrepreneurial journey. But you know what I mean by all the like, hey, I just ran three months of ads. It didn't have a pixel installed on my, <laughs> my web page. Like, wasn't that a really bad idea? Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that those hard lessons of entrepreneurship will fall away. Um, but I am glad that I'm learning them because I know that it helps me connect. Um, and it helps us all connect as kind of an entrepreneurial community. When did you move to the mountains? Uh, two years ago. Oh, you were like, I'm done. It's a wrap. I'm out. Deuces. <laughs> and you're like, oh. like so you, yeah. mo you moved from Santa Rosa to. No, I moved from San Francisco Ooh. when I was. Ooh. When I was doing the radio show in um, Santa Rosa, I was actually driving an hour each way and paying a bridge toll to get oh. paid less than minimum wage. So yeah. that was, that was rough time. Especially but, in San um, Francisco. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when we moved up here, we had been living in Bernal Heights in San Francisco, which not only is San Francisco, but it was named the number one most up and coming neighborhood in all of the United States about... <laughs> So a year after we moved there. So it's five so thousand we dollars for a closet. <laughs> oh yeah. So I kid you not. But before we moved up here, um, we were we were paying very close to five thousand dollars in rent. And um, my younger daughter, when she was born, her nursery was in the closet of my <laughs> I believe it. I believe older it. daughter's room. I, I believe it. The last. It was a very nice closet. We hung a curtain. <laughs> we had a... Last time I went, I this is how I knew. This area, I don't. I just didn't get it. Um, I had to go there to teach a class um, for three days, and they told me like kind of last minute, like I had like a week to get there. So I look for an Airbnb, and I'm looking for Airbnbs. This is by South San Francisco, over by the airport. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, maybe I'll go to Santa Cruz or just get away or anywhere or the other side of the bridge where it's kind of just industrial-ish. I couldn't find a room for less than 420 bucks in a hotel. No, no. I mean, at, yeah. at like a Red Roof Inn was like 325. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I The last time I went to visit a, a client in San Francisco, um, and I was doing some work with them kind of as a favor. So I was like, you know, I'll, I'm going to pay my own, you know, since I'm just coming down from the mountains, I'll pay, I'll pay my own hotel. So wrong. The <laughs> only hotel that I could find was on the corner of like sixth and Howard or something. If you know anything about that area, it was like the worst. So I'm like shivering on this rock hard bed, listening to like crack deals go on. And I think an <laughs> ambulance got called like next door to the thing. And like, I came rolling into my client the next day and being in client services, I'm like, I need to be on the top of my game for my clients. And I need to be like, you know, put together and prepared and like, all and I walked in just like shaking <laughs> and, like, <laughs> bags under my eyes. And I mean, I'm used to it because I, you know, I hadn't lived anywhere, but San Francisco and, and New York, but being like that much, in the heart of it. And I think I still ended up paying like $275 a night yeah. or something. Like if you're that. from, if you've watched television and you've gotten your, your ideas from, of California from television, there are some places you can have a rude awakening. <laughs> of, but that's neither here nor there. But I want to thank you so much for being on the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast. Oh, thank you. It was awesome. And I feel like since I was on the Billionaire Lifestyle podcast, that's kind of a manifestation yep. and a vision board of its own. Yep. So, yep. yeah. Absolutely. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is how we conclude this episode. Remember, you are a billionaire. Two to the power of 30. 
when mommy and daddy, or however you got those two cells together, they started their dance. There were three components. There was one that came from the male, another that came from the female, the other came from source. Without the source, you wouldn't be who you are today. So remember that you are created in an image. You are a hue, H-U-E, dash man being. You are a person of color under the sun. I don't care if you're white, black, pink, green, you're of a color. And you're in the image of man, woman, human, man, man, whatever you want to be, male and female. Now the thing we have to do is get to the experience. And the experience is what we have problems with. You are sent here for a purpose. Get out of your own way. You have to get out of your own way so that you can live your billionaire life style. That's what the source puts you here for. So you can live in this beautiful body, created with billions of cells, and have that lifestyle experience. Remember, when you get out the shower, drop your towel, walk over to the mirror, shake it a little bit, and see all that body is created because you're a spiritual being having a physical experience. You are the perfect you that you were supposed to be. Once you take it all in, turn around, you know, show your back. You know, you might have a little back fat. That's all right. It's all good. It's what we are. We are human. We were born in that suit. Now, I want you to get close to the mirror. Look in your eye. And your eye looks like nebulae in the sky. As above, so below. As you think it, the body manifested and you can create something out of nothing. As above, so below. When you come across another entity who has those nebulae in their eye, like the nebulae in the sky, treat it with love, honor, and respect as you would be treated because all the doctrine says those rules are what we should live by. Till next time, love you all. Peace.